um, two books together, of course. How do they relate? Like that. This is the praxis. Praxis means policy or attitude toward improvement, political goals, and it comes from backcasting, this comparative history of China, Japan, and Europe. If this is the green constitutional engineering, it came from 10 years of my study of global comparative history of environmental problems. I argue you can have a green theory of history uh, from comparative case studies of China, Japan, and Europe. And not just an epoch history, not just a history of ancient feudal capital. That's the Marxist model. So it's an argument against viewing history in a linear form only. I argue the same patterns have been happening, and we can learn from that. The patterns happen at larger scales over time, and we can learn from that too. So I argue that an unrepresentative state, a state that builds itself without a lot of representation does three things. It creates environmental degradation, typically through consolidation of the economy, increasingly for private groups against the larger public. And the state changes over time to defend the private consolidated wealth of those groups in repressive ways. Two, it does this by changing the structures of the society. It begins to not serve distribution issues, but maybe protecting consolidated wealth issues. Cultural change. During this period, the state ceases to be legitimate. People change their attitude towards the state. They no longer look toward it as their savior, but begin to see it as their enemy. And I argue the material inequalities and environmental problems link with religious movements. In a Marxist view, let's compare that. A Marxist view, religion has nothing to do with material politics. I argue there is a material politics in real religious movements in three areas. In health movements, many old religious movements in the past or the present have a lot to do with alternative medicine, new forms of legitimate forms of healing. Um, ecological, either directly by protecting their own local compound, or by rejecting taxation or extraction. Religious groups will defend their region against the state or elite extraction. And I argue you can find that there's an economic reason for a lot of old religious institutions. They were welfare states in many ways. They were not just an ideological movement, but people joined them for economic security throughout their life, when they were sick, when the state ceases or is contributing to be a material problem. I argue there is a linear history, but I argue the cycles get larger and repeat. The past or present, I argue, is similar at ever larger scales of state degradation. And as I was writing this, I, what do you do structurally about this? Um, and I said, most argue environmental movements are a novel feature of you know, world politics. I argue they are a durable feature of a degraded political economy. Past or present, environmental risk politics became expressed in religious change movements as oppositions to state environmental degradation, using discourses available. Now, people will use science to critique other science from the state, but long ago, states legitimated themselves on religious discourse. And so new religious discourse critiqued the state and typically housed a lot of material politics. Ecological revolution describes characteristics why our historical states collapse, and because of these characteristics are opposed predictably by religio-ecological movements. As a result, origins of our large-scale humanocentric axial religions, this is really a history of the origin of large-scale ethical systems. Um, they're connected in a lot of ways to environmental movements from the very beginning. This would be things like forms of Mozi or Zoroaster. Uh, we're dealing with the Hebrew prophets. We're dealing with early Christianity. We're dealing with Buddhism. All occurring during periods of systemic warfare and, and violent fighting and huge destabilized areas. Many major religious movements 
movements of the past, I argue, were environmentalist by being, on those three levels, health, ecological, and economic movements, and ideological movements, rolled into one. Since ecological revolutions are endemic, they continue. <clears throat> China, Japan, and Europe were analyzed over 2,500 years, showing how religio-ecological movements get paired against chosen forms of state environmental degradation. This is the key point. It's an alternative. We don't, this is not fate. I argue it's a particular organization that has caused this. It's not states by definition that do this. It's particular ways the state becomes organized by corrupted interests. And I describe solutions uh, to this, of course, and it should be useful to all people seeking solutions, or at least debate about the origins of environmental problems. Two covers again. Um, the main debate now, of course, that we're living by most biologists' estimation within the world's sixth die-off of life on the planet. This is estimated to be much larger than others in terms of species loss due to our human habitat destruction, both land and ocean. Unlike other die-offs, which were caused by external forces, maybe asteroids, or whatever, perhaps volcanic eruptions, according to some, which changed the chemistry of the air. I argue, you know, the poorly unrepresented states uh, are doing this, despite the world being in the midst of a huge, disorganized opposition to it. This is, we're living in an era of the largest social movement in history in organizational numbers. This is global environmentalism. If you're curious about the data, please look at the book Blessed Unrest. If you want, post a summary of things you read about it on the web to the blog uh, this next week. And the subtitle, How the Largest Social Movement in History is Restoring Grace, Justice, and Beauty to the World by Paul Hawken. Paul Hawken is actually a multi-millionaire businessman who is very interested in green technologies and sells and works in that field. I argue that the bioregional state idea aims to organize this movement in a common goal to facilitate its different areas within each other. It allows for elites, just more environmentally representative ones. Two themes from it, which I will talk about, are local organizations. There's civic democratic institution, which is non-governmental, and there is a commodity ecology, which is a local optimal collection of choices that people make that fit their environment, that fit their local culture, and that do not damage other regions. It's not anti-status, it's pro-status, which is, contradicts me with a lot of the environmental movement. Much of the environmental movement tends to be entirely localistic and not concerned about larger state politics. I think both are required. Um, I think the current organization of the state, the systemic issue, is the thing to solve. And otherwise, my prediction, this is what Juvenel would call the primary forecast, the forecast without change. I argue from history, a similar process will occur without intervention. An unrepresented state will continue to cause environmental degradation despite any local areas coming to their senses and saving it. I can only help the global environmental movement to have images for how local issues can join together in state formation. That's why I call it polity formation, polity creation. A polity is a state instead of just policy creation. That's a way of contrasting this view with other views. Uh, other, otherwise, proponents of other means of the future, like mere policies or maybe a political party, can be easily reversed and sometimes only join within the problem instead of moving against the historical process that I am arguing for. A main theme, everybody lives in a watershed. So here's some of my images of a potential future, which you can think about. This is a biological reality. Everybody lives in some aspect where water flows to the center and flows out. So everybody lives within some boundary framework through which water flows. 
and watersheds are nested. You know, that's what we saw. But every watershed will be connected to the next. And so larger regions share the same water. This is an image of biologically what the state of Texas in the United States looks like. Here's the artificial square lines. So I'm arguing these artificial square lines uh, don't really reflect a lot of good feedback. People who would be concerned about the environment in this watershed are split between states, and they can't provide feedback on the degradation that they share. What if you had, this is one example, what if you had a watershed voting district? These are the rather square-shaped voting districts of some parts of the United States. If you were to slide in the map of the watersheds and use them as voting districts, that is one of the 60 ideas in the book. This is from the Korea Times, an editorial that I published in 2009. Let me just read this small excerpt of this. I say there are three major political concerns of Korea. Equitable economics, constitutional change, and the environment. But they're seldom discussed together, despite being interlinked. I suggest a method to interlink them with green constitutional engineering, widening the claimed Green New Deal here toward one of political stability, demotion of corruption, and more representative, equitable development. The three ideas are offered for constitutional revision debates in Korea and how green constitutional engineering can solve them. I only describe the first debate, but if you're curious for the other two, you can look up green constitutional engineering at the Korea Times. The first debate is over districting. And everything that I've read in English doesn't discuss one major problem. Most ideas for districting, they're very partisan. A gerrymander means you put everybody who supports you in one district and you push everybody else out. Um, that does not lead to a competitive party system. According to some people in the United States, most states, like even California, like, uh, California has over 50 different election districts, and it's estimated as only one or two that are party competitive. Both parties have agreed to build a physical institution that doesn't allow those parties to be removed. And that's why in the United States, there's a huge amount of people who can get reelected without much party issues. Four years ago, for the election to the US Congress, there were over 20% of the people, they had no one running against them. They simply were put back in power because the other parties, they realized the district has been drawn around their supporters and it doesn't provide any competition. A good example where this competition happens is in the state of Maine. Maine is very near Canada. It's at the top, you know, upper right, upper northern, eastern point of the United States. Ironically, the person's name was Eden. Eden. The Christian theory of Eden was the green world of perfection. Um, his name is Mark Eden, and he is the only Green Party candidate to win a state-level election. Why? Because he ran inside a Democratic gerrymandered district and won. And the Democratic Party dominated the state of Maine. What did they do? One of the first things they did after he was elected, they did not let him have an office in the legislature. He was elected, but they didn't give him an office. They didn't give him staff. And they redrew all the districts. They split the district where he was elected. They didn't want that to happen again. This is what I'm talking about. The institution was changed to try to stop the Green Party from being elected. To make sure that that large vote that existed accidentally in that area did not happen again. But he moved to one half, re-registered, and was elected again. And, by the way, he has gone on to be the most publicly loved representative in the state of Maine's history, according to polls. 